Okay, I think we can. Uh, I think we can start. I think that uh, we're getting Friday afternoon of the conference, and uh, uh, people are beginning to disappear. So we have a, a pretty small, but I hope it'll be a lively. Uh, it'll be a lively group. Uh, Anyway, I want to welcome you. I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the chairman of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and uh, I'm on their board of, board of directors of the Atlantic Council. And I do want to welcome you today uh, to our panel on the Southern Gas Corridor. It's a subject close to my heart uh, in that uh, I started working on resources from the Caspian back in the 90s at the time of the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline and <clears throat> it's been a good part of my life the last uh, uh, the last seven or eight years uh, working on the southern gas corridor uh, including when I was ambassador to Azerbaijan prior to Bob Sakuta getting there uh, but this is a uh, tremendously I think a tremendously important project uh, it's comprised of the uh, uh, of gas going from uh, Azerbaijan through Georgia to Turkey uh, through the Trans-Anatolian pipeline uh, to the Trans-Adriatic pipeline uh, and it's actually the South Caucasus pipeline going through uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia and it's, so it's a series of uh, infrastructure projects designed to bring energy produced from the Shakhtanese 2 field to uh, Turkey and to Europe. The initial amounts will be 16 billion cubic meters, of which it's uh, six will uh, be to Turkey and 10 will go on to Europe. So it will be the first gas going uh, from the Caspian to Europe. Uh, this is a project that's 3,500 kilometers long and will cost uh, a total between <coughs> Shakhtanese and the pipelines, $45 billion. Um, so it's a, it's a, this is a, this is a big deal. And, uh, and I will say, you know, I'm the moderator, I should probably stop talking, but, you know, once I start on the Southern Corridor, uh, that the pipeline system is scalable, so that although it's only 16 billion cubic meters coming from Shakhtanese now as more gas gets developed off of Azerbaijan and possibly is available from other places uh, uh, that the size uh, that the size can be increased and and the main thing is that this will satisfy the long-term interests of Europe in getting gas uh, from an alternative source uh, and to some extent, even though it's a small amount at first, uh, helping to reduce, for some of the countries, helping to reduce the reliance on a, uh, on a single, single supplier. So we'll get into, uh, what, this is not going to be a whole bunch of speeches. I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to ask questions of the panel uh, and then open it up, um, open it up to, the, uh, to the audience. But we have a terrific panel. Uh, we have Bob Sakuta, who uh, succeeded me as uh, ambassador to Azerbaijan, <coughs> and uh, uh, Ambassador Sakuta is also. God, you can look at his biography. He had a myriad of posts in the State Department, uh, in, uh, including being the principal deputy assistant secretary of the Energy Bureau. Uh, he was a sanctions person at one point. He spent a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, Can't keep a job is what it really comes down to. <laughs> right. You know, people have long, bi you know, long biographies like Bob and like me. It just only shows that we're old. Uh, I also, <clears throat> I also want to welcome <coughs> uh, Bud Coot, who's <clears throat> now a senior fellow, resident senior fellow 
at the uh, Global Energy Center. And Bud, Bud was, was the principal energy analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency <clears throat> and spent 42, I would say, to be accurate, 42 and a half years uh, at the uh, CIA. Uh, but I can tell you, we can guarantee he was an analyst. He did no, <laughs> no undercover stuff or, or anything. He's safe to talk to, and you know. Uh, <clears throat> but he's truly an expert uh, on the Caspian, and, and in all seriousness. And his uh, his most recent report, uh, the Caspian Sea and Southern Gas Corridor Review from Russia, literally we're launching today. And uh, so uh, Bud will talk some about that. Uh, and his overall views on the Southern Corridor and, and the Russia aspect. We also want to welcome uh, Saltuk Duziol, uh, who's the general manager of the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline Project. He had been president of the Colon Energy Group uh, and chairman of the board and CEO of Botash uh, prior, uh, prior to that. And um, Saltuk will get into what, you know, where are we with respect to the pipeline? <clears throat> some issues with respect to other parts of the project, not in Turkey, I might say. Uh, and also, why is this so important uh, to Turkey? And will it continue to be important to Turkey? And then finally, uh, I'm very happy to have on the panel uh, Mr. Javad Yarjani, uh, who has had a long and distinguished career uh, in, the oil and, in the oil and gas sector. He's been the former Iranian national representative uh, to uh, OPEC and has been the head of the petro petroleum analysis at OPEC and uh, has also advised Petropars and served in several capacities with the National Iranian Oil Company. And so it'll be really interesting to hear uh, uh, Javad talk about <clears throat> what Iran's goals may be with respect to the Southern Corridor, and is it any kind of priority from an Iranian standpoint? So <clears throat> let me start with, uh, uh, with Ambassador Sakuda and um, ask you to talk about where you see, where you see things with respect to the corridor. Is, uh, why is this so significant from an Azerbaijan standpoint? Uh, is this something that you think whatever the geopolitics are among major chess players in the world, will this continue to be a major priority uh, for Azerbaijan? And, uh, and how, you, how, you see, how you see things at this point? Thanks, Dick. Um, now, I think, you know, as you sort of intimated at the beginning, this is, this is part of a project or a set of projects that the United States has been backing and helping see come to fruition for now close on to 20, 20 years. years. right? Um, and there's a reason for that. We learned the hard way in the 70s that energy is a tool of, you need to have a secure energy picture for your country to be secure. That energy can be used as a weapon. Um, the United States went through that experience in, uh, with OAPEC, and uh, we, we, made st we took steps afterwards in setting up the International Energy Agency, setting up the <coughs> Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, going to more energy efficient programs, d using, d uh, utilizing domestic energy. We took steps, and other countries learned that same lesson. Um, Azerbaijan, and Dick was an important part of this, um, in the 90s developed the ACG field, the contract of the century, moving oil out of the Caspian for the first time directly, not going up through Russia, uh, the baku tbilisi Jehan pipeline. We fast forward to where we are today, and just as we saw the situation in the 70s, where oil could be used as a weapon for um, pushing countries to political goals, so you put pressure on them, there are instances today that we've seen the same thing going on with gas, and that's not a secret. And so what is so important about this project is you have a huge field which is sitting in a part of the world which has not been, ironically, given the history of the Azerbaijani energy province of being the oldest, uh, but it has been one that's always been easy to get things out of. Um, and where we are today is 
the, with working with the Azerbaijan government, working with other governments, the United States, the European Union, Turkey, Greece, Italy, Albania, in particular, is a part, key partners in this, but also others further afield because they're going to benefit from this. What we're seeing now is a concerted, determined political effort to realize a major gas project which will increase security in Europe that will increase the ability of countries to be able to operate, to have their own foreign policies without being necessarily beholden to somebody else. It comes back to the same principles we've talked about for 20 years, diversification of sources, diversification of types of fuel. And so while there have been other projects that are being kicked around and discussed, this is one that will bring new molecules from a new place to the market. That's why it's important. That's why the United States has been backing this and working on this. Dick did this in his old jobs. I've worked on this, almost others. Um, and so the point that I just I would probably try to close with uh, is this is something that has been going on through a number of administrations, both parties. But I really want to refer to the points that Secretary Tillerson communicated back in February when there was a meeting of the Southern Gas Corridor Advisory Council. There are two things I really want to highlight here. And these are both points that were made. One is Azerbaijan has played a key role in pursuing our shared strategic goal of diversifying regional energy supplies, increasing market competition, and strengthening European energy security. The second point that I think it bears remembering is the Southern Gas Corridor, which will provide new supplies of gas from the Caspian to Europe remains a strategic priority of the United States and is a critical project for Azerbaijan and for European energy diversification. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Bob. Maybe, could you comment, and we, regretfully, we don't have anybody from the Azerbaijani government on the panel, but uh, uh, about Azerbaijan's commitment and why they will stay committed uh, to this project. I would, and again, I'm the American ambassador, so I'm, Mr. Malazadi there maybe can comment. <laughs> and he's in the opposition party, right. as he will always point out to me. Uh, uh, but the uh, the Azerbaijan government is fully in on this project. They have worked really hard. Um, President Aliyev, personally involved in this thing. Sokar, hugely involved. Um, I have seen them in terms of engagement with other ministries, with other ministers from other countries. This is a topic that they brought up in their conversations with other governments. Um, the uh, President Aliyev's efforts and organizing the Southern Gas Corridor Advisory Council meetings, which have three now in February in Baku, um, these are exercises that th they aren't speechifying moments. They're moments to really look at what is going on and to help solve problems. This last time, uh, one of the issues that we dealt with, um, our colleague Robin Dunnigan was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of, of Energy from the State Department who came out for this. Um, one of the issues that we dealt with is, are the delays that have, that have been occurring in Italy and how to address those. And so the Azerbaijanis brought together the United States, they brought together the European Commission, they brought together Georgia, Turkey, Greece, Albania, Italy, among others. Uh, they brought together the international financial institutions to go through the details and to work things out and to find ways forward. And there were commitments, I think, that were made at that meeting to sort of help address some of the delays that have been occurring with the pipeline. Um, I think the... the BP and the others who have been working on this, they can talk about the, 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 com the commercial angles on this, but one of the things I think that's also been important is the Azerbaijani government has also worked to help get the financing going. So I would say that this is, again, remember I'm the American ambassador. Um, I don't, can't really speak for the Azerbaijani government, but from my under, my, where I'm sitting dealing with the Azerbaijan government, I see very strong and very continued commitment to this project and, and uh, pride, frankly, and doing what is one of the world's largest infrastructure projects. Okay, uh, that's great. Well, uh, let me ask Dr. Duzio, uh, and you'll see I'll be going back and forth between first names, last names, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, tell us a little bit about, <clears throat> I'll ask you sort of maybe sort of three sub-questions. 
how is the TANAP project going now? Which, by the way, has, SOCAR, speaking of the Azerbaijani commitment, SOCAR, I think, are they still the majority shareholder in uh, TANAP? So there's, you know, SOCAR, state oil company of Azerbaijan, has put their money where their mouth is. So they, th th that alone uh, indicates the commitment. But how, how, is the, how is the project going? Uh, and uh, how do you view, given all the different alternatives like Turkish Stream and maybe other alternatives and, and again the geopolitics and the Turkey-Russia relationship and so forth, uh, how, do, how do you view Turkey's commitment uh, to, this pro uh, to this project? And, and, and what about the problems? You know, uh, ironically, People had conjured up all sorts of potential problems uh, on this project. I'm not sure people really thought about Italy being where the primary problems would be, uh, but that uh, that certainly seems to be the case now. Uh, so, if you could briefly uh, fill us in on on those issues. Sure, sure, I will do that. But before ans answering your questions, actually. Uh this session reminds me a very interesting conversation that I had with, with Mr. Morningstar almost eight years back. I think it was uh, year 2009. Uh, we met in Ankara for the first time. Mr. Morningstar was special envoy of the United States for Ener Euro-Asian energy projects, and I was managing director of Potash in those days. Uh, it was a time where Potash was uh, really in difficulty in coping with the ever increasing demand of Turkey. Turkish gas market, and at the same time, very much concerned about the uh, supply security of the country for the future. And uh, that's why we were desperately seeking for some new opportunities in the region to have more access to natural gas. And Azerbaijan was the only potential country in those days, I mean, who could deliver some volumes in the short run. And uh, it was also a time where Botash was involved in two different international projects like Nabucco and ITGI. TAP also was another competing project and everyone was competing for the same source of gas. Uh, but it, it, with, I mean, uh, in, in Azeri there is, there is a saying goes, I mean, it says well, uh, there is a wedding ceremony in Groom's house but uh, Bryce family is not even aware of. <laughs> it was a situation like that. Uh, and uh, Azeri is actually always wanted to be a part of uh, this gas supply chain, not only as a producer, but also a midstream investor. So they would like to also control some part of the uh, midstream. So all these projects, I mean, competing with each, each other, I mean, at the end of the day, failed except for uh, TAP. Uh, Azerbaijan has made a very wide, uh, very wise choice and uh, together, I mean, Mr. Aliyev together with Mr. Erdogan decided to give a start to TANAP project where Azeris could al also be a part of the midstream, uh, part of the gas supply chain. Uh, I mean, everything has developed very quickly. In 2012, we s signed this uh, intergovernmental and host government, government agreements uh, one year later, in December 2013, we took our final investment decision. Uh, in March 2015, we held our groundbreaking ceremony. It has been almost two years now, and since then we have made uh, remarkable progress in our project. Uh, phase zero, which we call, I mean, from the section from Turkey-Georgia border up to Eskişehir offtake point, uh, which is 56 inch diameter and 1,033, uh, 333 kilometers in length. This section is almost completed. 80% uh, of uh, the construction activities are completed as of today. The remaining section, which is from Eskişehir to Turkey-Greece border, including an offshore section of 36 inch, an onshore section of 48 inch, uh, almost completed 45% as of today. So in total, we have achieved some 70% progress. Uh, we are targeting to deliver the first gas to Botash by June 2018, and one and a half year later to TAP, although we see some delays on TAP side. Uh, we have driven more than 107 million kilometers uh, between our construction camps. 
stockyards to, to the uh, place of work. Uh, we have worked more than 42 million man hours at site. At peak level, we have reached 11,000 people and 4,300 construction machinery at site. It's a huge and very demanding project indeed. Uh, so TANAP is on the right track. We don't expect any delays at all. This year will be a very critical year for us because we are targeting to achieve mechanical completion by the year end. Right after that, we will start commissioning our pipeline and uh, after a six months commissioning period, hopefully uh, the first gas will be there for Botash by June 2018. Uh, TANAP is definitely a very important project, not only for Azerbaijan, but also for Turkey and, and Europe. It paves the way for some new uh, investments in the region. Uh, it may also pave the way for some uh, interconnecting pipelines in Southeast Europe uh, for countries who desperately need uh, some uh, supply diversity because many of them are too much dependent on a single source country, Russian Federation. Uh, for Turkey, it means a lot because uh, it will directly supply the gas to, to the consumption centers of Turkey, which is to the west of Eskişehir. So it will be a platform for uh, Turkey to have access to an additional 15 BCM of ga gas if it needs, if it requires. Uh, although we are uh, building only um, a 16 BCM transportation capacity for the moment, our design capacity is 31 BCM per annum. By adding up some new compressor stations, we can easily reach to this uh, design capacity in the years to come. Uh, just in case the other fields like Absheron, uh, Kepes in, 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 in Caspian region, I mean, if these projects are materialized, I mean, we can easily have these, see these volumes in our pipeline. For the moment, it's a single entry point project, unfortunately, I mean, according to the host government agreement, if the Turkish government grants a multiple entry rights to our project, it may also be a platform for further volumes that may be exportable by Iraq and Eastern Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean suppliers. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, the success of, of the success of TANAP is too much dependent on the other projects in the Southern Gas Corridor. As far as I know, the upstream investments and CPX investment are going on the right track. But, I mean, we still have some uh, questions regarding the TAP project because of the uh, political problems that they faced in Italy, in Puglia region. Although TANAP has uh, started uh, almost one, one and a half year later uh, than SCPX and uh, almost four or five years later than TAP, I think we are the most, uh, I mean, progressed project for the moment among all these projects of, of Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, in terms of competing projects like uh, Turk Stream, uh, all I can tell is, I mean, for the moment, uh, we don't expect any competition created by Turkstream to TANAP because TANAP is a project where, I mean, uh, the transportation volumes are already secured for a period of 15 years under gas transportation agreements. We do have a fixed tariff also for the set period. Uh, so uh, as a purely transmission business, TANAP uh, does not see Turkstream as, as a competitor, but in the mid-run and long-run, Turkstream will definitely create some kind of competition for shippers, because uh, the shippers of future volumes of gas that will be transported by TANAP will definitely have to uh, compete with Russian gas on Turkey-Greece border. But at the end of the day, I think uh, all end users will benefit from that, uh, because uh, creating gas to ca gas competition in Turkey-Greece border will help everyone to uh, have uh, to increase the uh, monopsonic power of the buyers against uh, the suppliers. Uh, but of course, it will also negatively uh, impact on uh, the investment decisions for further volumes to be produced in, in uh, Azerbaijan in the Caspian. Uh, because price competition is something that is not uh, well perceived by upstream investors, that's, that's uh, very well known. Uh, I mean, I, I'm quite optimistic about the future of Southern Gas Corridor. Once we commission our pipelines, I think uh, everybody will win. 
uh, including producers, transit countries, and, and end users. Uh, it will definitely contribute to the supply security and diversity in Europe and Turkey. Uh, TANAP is the only project, actually, I mean, which provides real uh, supply uh, diversity and at the same time route diversity. TurkStream is only uh, serving for the second purpose, route, route diversity, and it will also help Turkey to uh, increase its uh, enhance its security of supply, especially in winter time. Everyone knows that uh, we face some shortages from uh, West Line because of the problems between transit countries and Russian Federation. So. Uh, Turks, Turk Stream may also be a cure for the pain of Turkey, especially in winter time, when these shortages happen. Uh, so I also see it as an important project for supply security of Turkey, but it may never measure ton up uh, when it comes to economic benefits and uh, future benefits. Uh, as ton up, I mean, we are totally building up a 1,850 kilometers of pipeline. I mean, we have uh, employed 11,000 people, almost 80% of our construction contracts were awarded to Turkish contractors. Uh, almost 80% again of the, of the scope of our uh, line pipes were given to Turkish manufacturers. I mean, we created uh, too many different opportunities, business opportunities for the Turkish uh, manufacturers and business uh, world. Uh, and. This is all I would like to share for the moment. Sorry for thank taking you. it very long. Th uh, thank you very much. I would make you know, just also one or, one or, one or two other points. Uh, I think I'm correct, at least the last time I checked. The TANAP project is also coming in significantly under budget uh, cost-wise because the cost of pipe is considerably less uh, and, and, and the like. The second point, I guess, you know, I, I would add is that even with Turkish stream, whatever the geopolitics are with Turkey and Russia, Turkey and the United States at any point in time, difficulties that Turkey has with Europe, energy has always been compartmentalized. And that the other thing is, is given that this is of such a strong interest to Azerbaijan, that the Turkey, the, the fraternal relationship, for lack of a better term, that's always referred to between Turkey and Azerbaijan, I think would prevent Turkey from ever taking any action that, on its part anyway, that would hurt Azerbaijan with respect to the project. But uh, anyway, I think that's true. <laughs> uh, okay, let me uh, move on. Uh, let me, uh, Bud. Uh, there's been some talk of Turkish stream, t some talk of Russia. Maybe briefly, very briefly, um, give the main points of your paper. And, you know, just on general principles, Russia is probably going to do everything it can to muck things up. What's your th what are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, Russia has been trying to muck things up. Uh, the uh, southern gas corridor hasn't uh, opened yet, but it already has a long and rich history of interactions with Russia. Um, attempts to, to block it with Blue Stream, Blue Stream 2, South Stream. Attempts to co-opt it by putting pressure on the Georgians to hand over control of their high pressure pipelines to Russia in return for previous ga de uh, gas debts in a lower price, uh, which they, they finally uh, refused. Um, but I'm going to um, surprise you a little, Dick, because I think the, the major impact of Russian influence on the Southern Gas Corridor is actually the, the isolation of Central Asia from the Caucasus. Um, and this makes uh, a considerable difference because it means that um, Turkmenistan uh, can't get its gas across the Caspian. At least there may be other ways, uh, but um, Turkmenistan has the second largest gas field in the world, the largest onshore gas field. It replaced a, uh, the Urengoy gas field in Russia in that respect. Urengoy at its peak produced 300 BCM per year. 
and Turkmenistan has a gas field that's larger than that. So it can fill its commitment of 65 BCM to China, plus replace every molecule of Russian gas that goes into Europe today. Uh, it's a high sulfur field, so it's going to be difficult to develop. Uh, but Russia realizes this, and uh, Russia really has um, put a stranglehold on its ability to build a, a Trans-Caspian pipeline. The uh, legal regime of the Caspian Sea has not been firmly established, but it's pretty much reached a, a status quo. There are only two major principles agreed to. One is that the environment of the Caspian Sea must be protected, and the second one is that every major decision must be agreed to by all five littoral countries. Uh, that includes Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Russia, Azerbaijan, and Iran. Now, a Trans-Caspian pipeline, in Russia's view, and also Iran's, is certainly a major decision, and that makes it uh, require a, a um, consensus of all five uh, littoral countries. And uh, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, two other agreements that have been reached is one that uh, no one outside these five littoral countries can introduce military assets into the Caspian Sea. And the other one is that all five countries have access to the whole sea for their shipping, um, except for the the coastlines. And in this environment, uh, Russia has built a Caspian flotilla, a navy of 26 vessels, four of which fired 44 cruise missiles at targets in Syria in the fall of, of 2015, uh, which sent uh, a message to everybody. So I think in the, in the current um, conditions, you know, we're not going to see a Trans-Caspian pipeline. Uh, with regard to Turkstream, I think we've, we've moved into a, um, a period of primarily economic competition now between the two southern corridors. People uh, sometimes forget that Russia has its own southern corridor, which is the onshore pipeline system it is building from the north down to the Black Sea. This is 2,500 kilometers um, broken up into two different pipelines and about uh, between 10 and 12 new compressor stations. Uh, so this, this is quite a, an expense and it's an investment the Russians are making. So they are determined to complete their own southern corridor um, right now with uh, Turkstream to bring the gas over into Turkey. Uh, but I think we will see competition beyond that in capacity in European pipelines because Gazprom has said they have excess producing capacity now and they also haven't met their goals of uh, making a big deal with uh, China for gas exports. So we're probably going to, they have mentioned in particular, uh, looking at the extra 10 BCM that is going to be added to the capacity of the pipeline as a means of getting gas itself distributed to Italy. Um, one piece of good news is uh, some people question whether Russia can underprice Azerbaijan's gas. And uh, my response to, be, to that would be no. Uh, Chandanese is a, a hugely prolific gas field. Uh, stage one, phase one, was uh, designed for 12 wells to produce 6.6 .6 BCM a year. And after six wells, they had more than met their capacity uh, limits. And uh, they didn't have to drill anymore. They were limited to the 6.6 .6 initially by the processing equipment on the platform and uh, uh, flow lines underwater. They've since uh, de-bottlenecked that so that 
phase one can uh, reach 10 BCM now. But that is, um, that's impressive. And on top of this, they're producing condensate right now in phase one, 50,000 barrels a day um, <clears throat> from only the five wells, sometimes four wells. And this is more than the average production of oil in the, uh, the AIOC fields. So they're producing more condensate out of a gas field. You can, you can see that Bud has uh, spent a lot of years uh, deal, dealing with these issues. I didn't mean to, uh, you... I'm pretty close to the end, but you know, what it really means for, for Azerbaijan is if they want that extra 10 BCM in, uh, in TAP, which they're capable of, um, they need to accelerate their exploration. Right. Absheron right. and the, the other fields, there's deep gas below AIOC and there's deep gas below the current Shadanese Phase right. 2 project. Right. Okay, let me, I want to make two quick points on what you said and then uh, turn it over to Mr. Uh, Mr. Yarjani uh, to make his points about Iran and then hopefully there'll be some time for some questions from the audience. Two points are, I agree with you totally on the Trans-Caspian Pipeline. Uh, we both have been working on this going back to the late 90s and I said even back then that it's not going to happen during my lifetime. Uh, and uh, I still would say the same thing. The problem for me, though, is that I'm getting old, so I don't know that that means much uh, at, uh, um, at this point. But uh, I, I guess I would still say it's going to be a long time, if ever, before there's a Trans-Caspian pipeline. Um, the other point I would make, and it will be interesting to see what happens, if Gazprom gets smart, and really does comply with the provisions of the proposed settlement of the competition case in the EU, and 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 acts like a uh, you know follows the rules and acts like a reasonable competitor. What are the chances? And I don't think we know the answer right now, but there is a chance that they could actually part participate in the Southern Corridor, and I know. I've been quoted publicly going back five or six years. I'm not sure I'm glad I made the statement, but I, you know, I said, "Oh, gee, if Gazprom follows the rules, they should be able to compete like anybody else, uh, with uh, even with respect to the Southern Corridor." Uh, let me uh, uh, turn it to uh, to Mr. Arjani, um, who was with us at our last Istanbul summit, and. Uh, Tell us what, what what are your thoughts on whether Iran will whether one whether it will participate would participate in the southern corridor uh, is it a priority or are there other priorities uh, that Iran has as far as selling gas within the Middle East region or to Asia uh, as LNG uh, and uh, and if it were to decide to supply the Southern Corridor, is there the infrastructure available to do it, and what would that take? So uh, if you could give us uh, briefly your thoughts on this. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. This is, a, as you said, the second time. I'm happy to be here. The fact that, you know, uh, there is a, you know, someone from Iran taking part in this important meeting although not part of the government, but uh, knowing the, the country and the potentials to be able to talk to, uh, uh, to people interested in the uh, situation of the gas industry in Iran. Uh, when I was trying to get uh, myself acquainted with, the, with this project, it was dubbed as a new Silk Road. And the countries which were envisaged to um, uh, participate, number one is Azerbaijan, naturally, and the, the first contract has been signed with Azerbaijan. Definitely the country has the uh, potential to do it. And, and being the Iranian Azari, uh, I will be very happy to see that, you know, our neighbor 
becomes more prosperous and because having the more prosperous neighbor is a, a blessing and uh, so that makes us the uh, you know uh, prosperous as well and also given the fact that uh, you know in the during uh, uh, Mr. Rouhani's administration uh, Mr. Aliyev uh, president of Azerbaijan was recently in Iran and he said that it is seven times they are meeting each other either in Baku or yeah in uh, in uh, Tehran so that shows there is a uh, uh, you know uh, getting closer to each other's understanding that there is no need uh, to be um, you know in competition definitely cooperation can be uh, something which uh, you know both country can uh, win uh, in this uh, you know uh, out of that the name of uh, after the name of Azerbaijan, the name of Turkmenistan was mentioned. If still they look at the Turkmenistan as a source of supplying gas to this, uh, you know, uh, uh, mega project. Uh, I mean, uh, say, having said that, definitely uh, for Iran as a holder of the uh, either first or the second uh, uh, gas reserve of the world. Uh, in competing with the Russia as a reserve holder. Uh, and the fact that much part, I mean, not all of Iran has been explored. And according to some Western uh, 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 oil man that, you know, we dig for the oil in Iran, we get gas. So that shows how uh, important the country is as far as the gas is concerned. And we know that there are more possibilities. So. After Azerbaijan, uh, the front runner to supply this in the Shah Deniz, uh, and in Shah Deniz, fortunately, Iran also has a share in it, and the success of that also will be partly the success of Iran. Turkmenistan definitely is a very important source. Uh, maybe uh, not many of you know that, you know, first the pipeline of Turkmenistan to supply gas was built by the Iranians in order to get their gas for the northern part of Iran in the cold winter. So we established a relationship and it was very fruitful, uh, sometimes ups and downs, but the pipelines as a means of connecting the consuming and producing country uh, is a kind of uh, you know, marriage, maybe Catholic marriage. I mean, it is very hard to uh, divorce, uh, especially given the amount of the investment uh, that Dick mentioned, you know, $45 billion. So definitely those who are interested in this project to be successful, they're thinking the, you know, ahead, I mean, other countries which can be part of supplying the gas to this mega project. Uh, I think Turkmenistan can play the role. Uh, 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 there is a pipeline from Turkmenistan to Iran, and from that connected to the Iranian pipeline, connecting to the Azerbaijan. Now, maybe not many people knowing this, but Iran has been, even we had the problem, so some problem with the Turkmenistan. This winter, they cut uh, the gas export to Iran because of some financial dispute, but always this dispute should go and find a way because we are connected. I mean, uh, this is the way that they're exporting. But despite that, they were able to swap their gas to, through Iran to Azerbaijan. So Qatar was getting this. And this can increase. And that can go up even to maybe over 22, 25. It sounds like you're saying, that, and, and tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, that it's more likely that there could be given that there probably won't be a Trans-Caspian pipeline, it's more likely that we could have Turkmen gas going through Iran into Turkey, and Iran would it's be a tr in, into the southern problem. corridor, and that Iran would be a transit country, and that that might even be a higher priority from an Iranian standpoint than directly selling Iranian gas into it. Or, or am I reading too much into what you're saying? And what I'm saying is, uh, again, you know, very recently Iran was able to bring, you know, five phases of the South Pars. South Pars is the joint field, the biggest field of the, you know, non-associated gas of the world shared between Iran and Qatar. Uh, so they have been, you know, started 10 years before Iran. 
much developed. They are one of the biggest exporters of the LNG in the world, the number one. We started 10 years later. They enjoyed the best technology available from the best companies in the world. We started with some Western companies, but then sanction came in. But despite the sanctions, despite all the problems, just recently we were able to bring our production to the level which is now almost equal to but Qatar. Where would that gas go? That gas, so far, Iran, again, you know, this is not something to be proud of that, but we are, the, you know, uh, having the reserve very high. But unfortunately, we are using the gas, again, one of the top consumers. Uh, I mean, this was the necessity which made Iran to have extensive gas distribution network, one of the high, biggest one in the world. The, the penetration of the gas in the Iranian uh, you know, economy is almost reaching 90%. Right. Uh, maybe unfortunately, but uh, local uh, members of the parliaments are so powerful, sometimes for even the villages with 10 families get the, you know, the grid, which is not something that I was living in Japan. I tried to see it. the rich country like Japan. They don't have that sort of system going this grid to the you know, small society. But anyhow, that's the fact. And that is equivalent to 3.5 million barrel of the oil. So the gas use in Iran has been enabling Iran to free its oil for the export. It's mm -hmm. helping. Otherwise, we were using all the oil at home. So, so f and now we are getting close to saturation. Uh, almost all our uh, power plants are going to do, use gas. Uh, households, as I said, the last province was Sistan, Baluchistan, the border of Pakistan. They just got recently the, uh, you know, the, the gas. So that's going to be the end of it. So very soon, almost entire population of Iran will be getting the gas. Then we will have the problem of the increasing deficiency because the price is low uh, and there is a big difference in the uh, you know, winter use and the summer use. So in the summer, we have excess of gas. So we have to export it. Uh, you said, what are the priorities? The neighbor countries definitely are the or first priorities. Uh, except Azerbaijan and Qatar, we have 15, I mean, in total 15, uh, neighbors and Russia in the uh, you know top of the Caspian, the rest are short in gas. Iraq maybe in future they will play the big role, uh, but now at this moment they need the Iranian gas. The pipeline has been laid down, contracts have been signed, and in in total 18 million billion cubic meter per year they will get it. Turkey has been you know, constant buyer of the Iranian gas. Uh, and uh, there was discussion with the Kuwait. Uh, you know, uh, it is the will of Iran to be a player there. Pakistan, you know, this pipeline, Iranian part has been, has been built. Uh, the only the problem is the Pakistani part. They say that they cannot get the financing, enough financing. Uh, some people, you know, uh, believe that they might be under pressure not to buy a gas from Iran. So, you know, again... Well, there might be credit issues, too. Credit uh, issues, and, but anyhow, uh, the fact that, you know, Pakistan is a country, has a potential, uh, you know, a big population, but very deficient as far as the uh, source of uh, energy. So it is great help to that country if they get the cheap or, you know, affordable gas from yeah. Iran. Afghanistan is another you know, possibility. So we have a neighbors, and then still there will be you know, a great uh, volume of the gas available in coming years. And the easiest one will be the, what I said, that you know, the relationship with Azerbaijan, and also playing the role as a, as a transit for the Turkmenistan. Um, so these are the easiest one to make uh, uh, this project feasible, uh, uh, you know, more feasible. Definitely it is feasible. Uh, Azerbaijan is a, you know, big producer. 
but that can be, and the fact of the, um, one fact, and I finish it, the first pipeline that was laid in Iran was going to Soviet Union in 1970. And the, the, the receiver of the that gas were southern, you know, uh, Caucasus of that time of the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan. And now we are giving also, there is the enclave of Nakhchivan, which uh, Azerbaijan doesn't have access. Iran supplies them with the gas. Armenia receives the Iranian gas. We get the electricity in return. So this is another way of exporting the gas, electricity. We are selling the electricity to other countries using our gas, natural gas. So potentials are there. Uh, and I cannot imagine that, you know, we have a project called Silk Road and Iran is, uh, you know, out of that. But we have learned to live, uh, you know, uh, in the, at the difficulties. Uh, sanctions have been harmful to us. But at the same time, it has le taught us to, to do many things that it was not imaginable 10 years ago. Uh, you know, these, there are some of these very mega projects in Iran have been, you know, uh, we have been able to do it uh, with the Iranian you know, experts by being partner first with the uh, Western companies and then we are doing, but we are open definitely and Total is now in the final stage of um, discussion and hopefully uh, as we heard, you know, today and yesterday that the energy should be bringing the people together and these pipelines should play as a pipeline, as a peace and prosperity for everybody. Thank you. That, that's really helpful. And I'm really glad that you were able to be with us. Uh, it ad adds a lot of insights that uh, we're not used to getting and need to get. We have a few minutes left. Uh, let's, uh, why don't I take two or three questions in succession then let the panelists answer them as they see fit, and then I think we're going to have to call it a session. Uh, Mr. Malazadi. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Well, we have a, uh... Thank you. We can speak without microphone. Uh, you know, <laughs> we had a lot of rallies and... Uh, yeah, you've got, you're a parliamentarian. Good. You've got a lot of... Uh, it's a chance for me, again, say thanks to Dick Morningstar, who was behind our energy success. Uh, early 90s, when we talk about uh, BTC, all our energy projects, uh, in Washington, people call us, you are dreamers. It's impossible. Never Russia or other your neighbors allow you to do it. But one of the dreamers was uh, Dick Morning and his team. And BTC is working. Now we have uh, our gas pipeline, which is delivering gas to Turkey. Now we're working on TANAP and TAP. But what's the importance of TANAP and TAP? This is a very important part of our strategy, to switch from zero-sum games in our region to win-win partnership, when everybody winning. Uh, there were uh, ideas that uh, Iran can participate in TANAP or, or TAP or all our gas projects. Russia, there is a competition now between uh, Gazprom and Rosneft which has an interest in gas, and uh, situation is changing even within Russia. Uh, competition between Russian players. Uh, I think that in this situation, it's, uh, I'm returning to Silk Road, you mentioned about that. This is our strategy. It's a Silk Road strategy is, uh, again, moving out of zero-sum games to partnership, which uniting uh, sometimes very, uh, different interests. For example, Israel, Iran, Turkey. Israel is one of the best partners of Azerbaijan. We are Muslim Shia country, I mean, by population. And what? We are, have the same interests, the same uh, security interests, and I think that the energy, our projects, but that's not only project of uh, uh, energy pipelines. We, together with Turkey and Georgia, should complete our transport corridor, which uh, will uh, connect by railroad uh, China and Europe. We have uh, other 
type of uh, things, but the most important thing, it's exchange of ideas. But in this situation, we need a real, active, strong United States in all our projects. I remember when Bill Clinton took the hand of Boris Yeltsin here in Istanbul and pushed them to allow us uh, BTC. Bill Clinton was in this process. You remember, Dick, how it was difficult. But we did it. And if the United States will disappear from uh, our region, we again will have chaos. That's why let's work for win-win partnership, participation, US, Iran, Israel, and even Russia. Thank you. I get a, your, your reference to uh, pipe dreams back in the 90s. Uh, it reminds me of the one of the maybe the un, one of the unhappiest days of my government career was when uh, Steve Kenzer, who was a reporter for the New York Times, wrote an article about Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline and the headline. Literally, this was the headline on the front page of the New York Times. I mean, it's amazing that they would have had enough interest to even. It said basically, uh, <coughs> Caspian pipeline is Clinton's pipe dream. Uh, and uh, anyway, so <laughs> it did happen. Uh, are there any, uh, do we have another question? Uh, uh, that was more of a comment, a question or two that, that uh, our panel can comment on. Uh, otherwise, I'll ask them to give their own closing comments. What a shy group. Uh, <laughs> If I, you know, I, I taught a lot in between the Clinton and Obama administrations. I could use the Socratic method and call on people, but uh, maybe that's not a good idea. Okay, um, why don't we do this? Uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let our panel make their final comments. One thing that I didn't do that I uh, should have done uh, at the beginning is to emphasize that this is on the record. I'm supposed to tell you to silence your phones, but that's too late now. Uh, and you can engage in Twitter by using the hashtag AC Summit, and then Bud's uh, Bud's report is uh, is available. Uh, and I'm not sure are they in the room? They've been on the chairs. Okay, good. So I'll, if uh, do you want to make any uh, based on what we've talked about, if uh, the four of you would like to make uh, very brief final comments, okay. At the beginning of my speech, I talked about an interesting conversation that I had with Mr. Mr. Morningstar some time ago, but I didn't mention what it was. I, I forgot. So, sorry for that. At that time, Mr. Morningstar was promoting this fourth energy corridor for Europe. It, in those days, it was not named as SGC yet. Uh, but, I mean, he was strongly backing, uh, opening up this new uh, corridor for Turkey and Europe, uh, especially based on Azure gas at, at the beginning. And in those days, all the projects, I mean, which were developed to transport gas from Azerbaijan to Europe were uh, competing for the same source of gas. And Mr. Morningstar, he knew that, I mean, we were also very concerned about our supply security as Turkey. and. We were uh, intending to spare any volumes available and exportable in, in Azerbaijan for our own use. He offered me that, I mean, you should give up this gas to the projects like Nabucco, TAP, whatever it is, for the sake of opening up this new corridor. And in return, we can give you some Am American LNG in three, four years' time. And, and time has shown that he was right. I mean, now L American LNG is in the marketplace. Uh, last winter, Turkey has received some LNG cargoes from the United States, which is good news for the whole uh, consuming markets. And together with Australian LNG, I guess in the future we will also see that some new LNG terminals, some new LNG infrastructures will be built in countries including Turkey. But I, I'm still quite confident that pipe gas will always be cheaper than LNG. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I just um, underscore one of the key points of my paper, which is that uh, you can actually influence uh, Russian behavior in a positive manner if you establish enough facts on the ground that they eventually accept and respect them. And those facts on the ground include infrastructure, strong partnerships, political support, and uh, financial strength in creating alternative export options for 
the smaller producing countries in the former Soviet Union. And uh, I think we also have to give uh, Haydar Aliyev a, uh, um, some kind of praise for having the wisdom to include a, a Russian and an Iranian company in the Shadanese project, which has helped also immensely. Well, uh, uh, as I said, you know, Iran uh, is changing uh, its face or uh, given the fact that, you know, reserve of Iran, oil and gas together makes the, the country the number one in the world. But as far as the uh, export is concerned, uh, uh, we have some, you know, good uh, uh, position as far as the oil uh, export is concerned, but when it comes to gas, we are far, far behind, uh, you know, main holder of the reserve in the world, Russia. And from now on, that the country has reached its uh, uh, point of saturation of the internal um, <coughs> consumption, and, uh, and it, it tried to increase the price of gas. It is not very easy when the the, the population are used to the subsidized uh, you know, energy to increase the price. But that is the only way gradually uh, the efficiency can come to this sector. And not only we have reached that saturation, but the consumption should go down. Iran, unfortunately, is among the countries which is flaring its gas, uh, you know, one of the highest, which is, you know, again, the problem of the, this being very cheap. Uh, we are reducing, but Iraq is more than Iran, but, uh, you know, uh, it is a great uh, waste and it can feed so many petrochemical, uh, you know, projects. So, uh, in that move and being behind as far as the gas export is concerned, from now on, it is going to be uh, the, the drive for being the, uh, you know, uh, important player in this field. We have started talking to the Omanis uh, because the, the, they don't have enough gas for their LNG plant. So these are the other possibilities. And India is also in the horizon uh, to get the Iranian gas. So we know we are not naive. We know, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, geopolitics play. And hopefully, as has been uh, stated, that, you know, uh, energy security is so important then, and the oil and gas business is a, a business of the peace. So if that is taken from the world to action, then Iran can play its uh, rightful position in supplying the gas to the, the world market. Thank you. Your point on subsidized gas is really important because that's the major problem that the former Soviet Union has faced, and the Ukraine being, you know, the, the, the classic example. Uh, Bob, closing comment? Yeah, I think just a couple things, and I actually I want to get to Dr. Molazada's point a little bit too. But I think, you know, sort of not just on this panel, but the other panels that we've all been listening to, I think, again, we come back to a couple basic points. One is energy remains important. It remains important for security, it remains important for jobs, it remains important for, prosper for prosperity. And I think each of us have talked about that in different ways. Um, two, when we look at this project and its scope, we see not just the immediate prospects of what this project is doing in terms of moving the gas machine Denise from the Caspian to Western Europe, but the potential in the broader realm, including Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey, and, the, and I think you know, we've you know, heard again and again about Turkey's own ambitions to be a, be a hub on this thing. Three is, I think, the point of, of playing by the rules, and that's you know, one of the problems, and we'll sort of leave that aside from, from some who have not played by the rules, and, and the suspicions that generates, and those suspicions will be there for a very long time. Um, and so I think this project is, is important. It has, uh, it has impact in the New York Times doesn't always get it right. Um, but I think the point, too, that I want to come back from, you know, Dr. Molzada's, uh, you know, comment is a valid one. And it's one of the things which we do look at. And that's why I made this point of stressing what Secretary Tillerson had said, you know, that we do, re we do see this project um, 
uh, as important, as strategically important, one that we, we continue to back, one which we continue to work on uh, directly and indirectly. And you know, the ironic thing is this is not one that we are particularly directly engaged in, but it does have, it, it has really broad benefits in terms of bringing stability to a part of the world that hasn't always been stable. So we think it, um, it, it makes a major contribution. And again, um, unlike a lot of other projects, um, it's coming in under budget. So that's also important. All right. Well, thank you. I think this, you've been a terrific panel. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so let's, uh, let's all thank the panel. And, uh